Hi, I'm Nicholas Kazemi, and I'm here with Richard Meyer, the co-author of a new book called Art and Queer Culture. So, first of all, let's define queer. What does sure. queer mean? Well, for the purposes of this book, we wanted to do a well-illustrated, like a visually pleasurable coffee table book that would include um, artists who were dealing with homosexuality or alternative transgender or transvestite cultures, but who wouldn't have necessarily considered themselves gay or lesbian, let's say in 1890 or 1910, because those terms weren't necessarily the ones in use. So we wanted to use a term queer that suggested a kind of ongoing resistance to the norm, whatever the, however the norm is defined, um, usually some heterosexual norm, and um, a term that would also still maybe carry a little bit of a a danger signal or a little bit of a, of a buzz, people not knowing quite what it means or not being so comfortable with it, including gay and lesbian people. So the book is basically a 125 year retrospective of yes. art in all its formats from periodicals and like magazine covers to posters to of course fine art and video art. Why 125 years? Obviously art that has dealt with homosexual subject matters has existed since the dawn of time. We see yeah. it all the time in Greek statues and whatnot. So why that bracket? Yeah, we really wanted to talk about it within the modern sort of age. So before the late 19th century, people were not, by medical science, identified as homosexuals mm -hmm. or heterosexuals for that matter. That, that simply wasn't a, a term that was in clinical use and it wasn't also in popular use. So partially this was about the idea that homosexuality as we know it today and gay and lesbian cultures as we understand them are largely a modern phenomenon, which isn't to say people didn't have sex. Obviously, going back to ancient Greece or Rome, there was lots and lots of men having sex with men. Women having sex with women is a more difficult history to recover, but clearly, like if you think of Sappho, or I mean, there's a lesbian history throughout history that needs to be reclaimed, but this was really about how artists were using the fact that there was a certain kind of visibility to homosexuals and other kinds of sexual minorities that hadn't existed, we argue, before the 19th century to the extent that it did in the late 19th century and then into the 20th century. There's lots of images of, of erotic relations between women, but often those are produced for men. And so they're produced for a implied or actual heterosexual male viewer. So we, de we needed to talk about this, and it's one reason why things like scrapbooks and postcards of Marlena Dietrich, um, lesbian scrapbooks, snapshots, we couldn't only have high art, because if we only restricted ourselves to high art, the lesbian history would be almost one, I mean, very, very uh, absent. And, but once you open things up to women's everyday lives, to amateur, so-called amateur photographers like the late 19th century great photographer Alice Austin, then you are able to reconstruct a lesbian subcultural history that otherwise might seem, if you just look at Picasso and, and, or, and Matisse, you know, you're like, okay, this is all about men. But I noticed one of the people who's not in the book is, and you talked about him last night in your lecture, but Matthew Barney, for example, is not in your is book. He's not in the book? I don't he could have been, he, yes. But he could have been yes. because it's kind of, obsession with the body and yes. physicality. There's a real homoerotic yes. um, fascination. I think we felt like Matthew Barney had gotten enough attention elsewhere. <laughs> like he didn't need to be in our queer book. But there are people like Charles Ray, who's a very successful, who did, who did this piece called Oh Charlie, 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 where he basically made a orgy, but all the figures are himself. He's giving himself oral sex. He's delivering anal, anyway, he's doing all these different things, but on figures that all exactly look like him. For which, for a straight man, to make a sculpture that shows himself getting um, penetrated and, you know, anyway, performing oral sex on himself is fairly unusual. So we felt like that was pretty queer, even though Charles Ray is not presenting himself as, there literally is homosexuality on display in this work of art, but it's by a straight artist right. with his own st straight body. Someone who, like the Tom of Finland right. body of work, that's not his real name, who influenced queer theory and queer art and even the gay movement in many right. ways. I mean, the way the leather man, right. as we've come to know him, has taken on a lot of Tom of Finland's kind of etchings and drawings right. and whatnot and incorporated them in their lifestyle. But it's not considered high art necessarily. No. Like Tom of Finland, who's in this book, is not high art. But there were many, um, so we really made, and that was. That was a big um, issue with Faden, Faden, or however, the publisher of the press, because generally they do books about contemporary art, modern and contemporary art, and it's high art. I mean, there, um, and we said, and as like I kind of mentioned this in passing before, but we said, look, it doesn't for this book, which is about the relation between visual art and queer culture. 
we're dealing with sexuality, and sexuality does not only happen in like high places. You know, like, like we're talking about a history of bars, we're talking about nightclubs, we're talking about um, bedrooms. And so we, we basically said it, to the press, the interest that we have, the reason why this is not a book of queer art with a capital A, but a book about the relation between art and queer culture, is because we're gonna actually follow queer culture where it takes us. And so an, an art like Tom of Finland's, which yes is cartoons, you could say, or you know, uh, that if we don't take Tom of Finland into account, then we can't actually understand later on what, for example, Maplethorpe does with the gay male body in the 1970s. Artists are not responding just to high art, especially queer artists. They're responding to a whole cultural history that includes what was going on all in all these different spaces. So there are bar murals, there are activist posters, there are anonymous photographs. Well, the Keith Haring picture that you right. have is basically, it was the, the, the drawings he did for the bathroom. The bathroom at the Gay and Lesbian Center in New York City, which is now, so it was the men's room, and it's very definitely the men's room because there are phallic, there are penises all over the walls. And that's also partially the way in which our, a lot of queer art the references that it's making or the culture that's inspiring it started out as illegal or, Ill or illicit in some way or somebody's idea of what was sin or what was sickness or what was um, a problem that the culture had to overcome. As a but now queer artists are sort of embracing that so-called problem as a sort of pleasurable legacy to draw upon. So thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you. Thank you.